What's shaking, everybody? Welcome to a Monday recruiting hour here on Orange Bloods Live. That's right. It's the Orange Bloods recruiting hour. I'm joined by Jason Sukumel, Chad Hastings. Welcome to everybody in the Specs chat. It's already on fire before we even get started. Shout out uh, to Sandman23. Yes, uh, someone claiming to be Steve Sarkeesian <laughs> entered the chat earlier. Uh, we'll, we'll take all of y'all's comments and questions. Super chats go right to the front of the line. Uh, for those of you, you know, wondering how you can be a part of the show, uh, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, get all, all those things we ask you to do on an annual basis. We absolutely, um, appreciate it starting off today. And Jason, I hadn't really thought about it a lot. Like I told Chad earlier, look, we're going to do. Um, there's some news on Jordan Davis and the running back out of Santa Ana, California, Mater Day, Modern Day, excuse me, uh, the number one player in the state of California, the number one running back in the country, the number 13 overall prospect in the country. And I started thinking, is this of all the guys in the state that the Longhorns are recruiting right now? And I'm looking at a, at a top 10 list right now, and you've got guys like, DeCorian Moore, Devin Sanchez, Jonah Williams, maybe Michael Fasusi is the answer to the question. The offensive lineman out of Louisville is the question of, is there anybody in this recruiting class that the Longhorns have a better chance of landing that's a nationally elite prospect than Davison? It might be Fasusi, but it might not be. It might actually be uh, yet another running back for Tashard Choice to go after. It might just be that we don't talk about him as much as some other guys, but he might be the single biggest national prospect that the Longhorns are recruiting in the 2025 cycle. Uh, if you're asking me who, you know, of those big time top national guys that you were listing, who do they have the best shot? I would say Jordan Davison over Michael Fasusi, if I'm being honest. Um, catch breaking news for you. Okay, you ready for this? Catch guilted me yesterday. To, I was like, I haven't done my recruiting board. So I started my <laughs> recruiting board today. And sadly, they have like a 150 or something, some odd scholarships. I kind of quit counting, like 140 or something. So it's going to be a, an endeavor. But um, I'm only on running backs. So good good place to start with Jordan Davison. I've got Jordan Davison catch at 60% to Texas. So I, and that's versus the field, right? So, you know, I know he's going to Alabama. I think he's going to Ole Miss. And then he's going to Ohio State once this dead period lifts in March. Uh, he was in, at Texas in January for the junior day. Um, he's been to Texas a bunch. Guys. He, even he doesn't remember how many times he's visited Texas. And whenever I ask him, he goes, man, I don't know. It's a, it's a bunch. So um, I felt this way, dude, for like literally probably going back to last summer, I saw Jordan at an event in Atlanta. And I just came out of that thing thinking it's going to be Texas or Ohio State. And I don't, I have not budged on that one bit. I think it's going to be Texas or Ohio State. I think Alabama was running a close third there when Nick Saban was there. You know, we'll see what happens. Maybe this new staff can blow him away at Alabama on his visit. Um, but I think Alabama's a, a distant third right now. Oregon's in play. Uh, but I think it's Texas or Ohio State. I favor Texas right now for Jordan Davison. Jason, to go back a little bit on this kid, born and raised in California. I know he went to modern day, but he's a born and raised California kid. You know, I think he is, Chad, but I'm not sure. Um, you know, I talked to his dad once, and I'm trying to remember. I don't – yeah, I think he's – I know he's been at modern day, and he's been on the radar for several years, and he's always been a Cali kid. So I don't know where exactly he was born, but I, I'm pretty sure he's got deep roots in California. So in terms of why you think, and there could be some obvious football reasons, but in terms of Sark having good connections out in California and that kind of thing, uh, I'm always fascinated by why those California studs are thinking about a school that's a long way away. You're telling me he's thinking of two that are a long way away from where he is. What do you think it is about Sark in Texas that that's drawing him? And even you think of Alabama, right? That's completely yeah. on the other side of the country. Um well, you know, Texas obviously has a running back friendly offense. We've seen that under Sark. Sark's connections out there. Sark's daughter, I think, still goes to Modern Day. His son graduated from Modern Day a year or so ago. Um, you know, Texas' new wide receivers coach went to Modern Day. Texas has a, a couple Modern Day kids on the program or in the program right now, including uh, one that they just signed 
last year, Brandon Baker. Um, so it's just a lot of ties. I mean, that modern day is, we'll say the powerhouse program, but modern day and IMG Academy, those are probably the two biggest powerhouse programs in all of high school football. So it's a good one to try to get a foothold into for Texas. And they've done a good job. Um, you know, Sark just, I tell you what, Sark just relates well. I mean, he's a California dude and kind of has those connections out there. Um, they just relate. He relates well to those players. Uh, California players, and even before Sark, I mean, Tom Herman and his staff did a good job of recruiting California. I mean, how you go back to Ricky Williams, right? And Pat Fitzgerald. I mean, Texas, there's a similar vibe. When I talk to some of these California kids, they go home from Austin when they visit Austin, like it kind of felt like California to them a little bit. I mean, obviously, much to the chagrin of people who live in Austin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're getting more and more like California. Exactly right. So, including the traffic that I, even in freaking Cedar Park, the traffic's ridiculous. But um, to answer your question, Chad, before I go get too off tangent, there, um, there's just a lot of things that they just feel comfortable with, including the staff, including teammates, uh, just kind of the vibe of Austin, the city. So, it just seems to mesh well for Texas and California kids in general, general, but certainly the kids at modern day high school. So, catch. Do we have some updated info for the folks on Jordan? Like, is there any uh, any juicy nuggets lately on uh, on the kid? Well, part of the reason why this discussion topic became one I thought we would lead off the recruiting hour with today is because Adam Gorney did an update, uh, and Adam in California, he knows the guys at this high school very well. Uh, Whenever I see him do updates on uh, kids from modern day, I think to myself, okay, well, he's probably talked to this kid directly uh, or he's talked to somebody who knows him directly. Uh, Adam's got real good West Coast connections. He included some discussion on Jordan in his rumor mill today. And I'll just read it to you, okay? Uh, quote, Texas and Ohio State could be the front runners for the five-star running back and the Longhorns could have the edge but some big visits are coming up. Some of this is stuff that Jason literally just outlined, but I'll say it again. Davison will be at Alabama on March 23rd. So that's the next visit that's scheduled uh, to get a feel for that new coaching staff and its offensive scheme. Then he'll go to Ole Miss on March 24th, and then he'll round out that trip at Ohio State on March 27th. Uh, playing in the SEC is definitely a draw, but the Buckeyes would be big too since he grew up idolizing Zeke Elliott. So that was kind of the update today from Gorney. Uh, I think the things that I would take from that, it was big that he visited Texas. You want to know why Jason's got Texas at 60% and the field at 40. And I'm guessing Ohio state would be a big chunk of that 40. Mm -hmm. Him coming to Texas before the dead period and making sure that was the first visit that, you know, it was kind of the big visit. And then the Real dead quick catch, he was debating that weekend. Ohio state had a recruiting event. It was like, do I go to Texas? Do I go to Ohio state? So he chose Texas over Ohio state for that weekend. I mean, obviously he's going to visit Ohio state in March. But. And that Ohio state's at the back end of this week of trips that he'll be taking, I think helps Texas, you know, when he came to Texas and, and he's, and Jason said it, uh, and, and the other thing I'd say about this before I, I go a year ago, Chad, if we were having this conversation, if we were doing the orange bloods recruiting hour on orange bloods live, it wasn't yet a thing, but if it had been, and I said, Jason, for regardless of classification, 2024, 25, 2025, 2026, if there's a modern day kid among all of the modern day kids, who do you think is most likely to end up? being a Longhorn, I think Jason and I, I don't want to speak for Jason. I'll let him clarify in a second, but I think we would have bet even a year ago on Davison more so than Brandon Baker, who ends up being a five-star guy that committed in the most recent recruiting class. That only helped Texas, but Davison really has been, he's visited the Longhorns a lot. I, I was putting together some visit lists for my 10 thoughts from the weekend yesterday and I kept seeing Davison's name on a bunch of different events and stuff that were coming up. And I thought, oh, I should do this on the out-of-state guys. But then it occurred to me, the out-of-state guys wouldn't quite look. Every guy's not going to look like Jordan Davison. He has visited the most. Uh, it's been constant. And 
I think ultimately this ends up being a Texas Ohio State battle, Chad. Uh, and I think the way the visit structure has worked, look, he's going to take his officials. So there's a, there's still steps in this to go. I think if you're Texas, you'd love to get him in for the spring game. And then you'd like to be able to time that official visit, Jason, I'm guessing in the month of June when they start having their, their big recruiting weekends. I don't know exactly what weekend that's going to be, but if we look at what it's been the past couple of years, we can probably put a good guess on it. The last two weekends of June, but, um, and he, Davison has told me he might take uh, a, a spring official visit or two, you know, you can take them like in April now, but, yep. but Texas will, will certainly try to bring him and almost certainly will bring him in uh, for a June official visit. Yeah. And again, if you can get him in for the spring game, and it not be part of an official visit package. For those of you who are wondering, the difference would be if he came to the spring game on an unofficial visit, he's got to pay for everything himself. Whereas on an, on an official visit, everything gets paid for by the school, including one guest. So they would be able to take care of a parent on dinners and things like that. Uh, but you'd like to get him on multiple shots. But I think Texas, I bet if you ask Steve Sarkeesian, he'd tell you that they think they're going to get Davison on campus three or four more times before the year is over. I'm sure they're quite confident that they think they're going to get Davison. They think they're going to get everybody all the time. <laughs> all coaches do. Yeah. <laughs> but Sark and this staff, especially uh, yeah. <laughs> they, and look, that's how you get great players, right? You, the, the, you exude confidence. And I think the players feed off of that, but yeah, I think, have you put in a crystal ball yet for Davison? I don't think I have, honestly. Uh, it's sad I should know that, but no, I don't. I have not. Me either. But I don't. Think, nobody. Nobody. Uh, a crystal ball. Shame on you, catch future cast. Future, future cast. Uh, nobody. There are no future <laughs> casts in for uh, for Jordan Davis. You know what? I might next Sunday for my ten thoughts from the weekend make that <laughs> yeah. my lead. We'll be running thin on recruiting things to talk about. I did that a year ago, and I put I made predictions on like ten kids. Maybe I need to revisit the predictions I made from a year ago, and then take some stabs on uh, some of the top kids in the state. Jason, beyond Davison, what else is on your brain recruiting-wise today? Uh, just this recruiting board. It's got my brain mashed already. Um, not a lot, man. I wish I could, you know, I, don't, I, I wish I had something sexy to talk about. But like you said, it's a dead period. The Texas coaches, you know, they're focused on other things right now. Um, you know, I did talk to – I posted it on our website uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. I talked to the new 2026 uh, quarterback offer, Troy Hewn, out of another California guy. Uh, he's been to Texas, I think, three times, and he said he'll be back uh, in the spring, maybe for the spring game. He'll be back in the summer. Loves the Longhorns a lot. This is one of two quarterback offers Texas put out last week, which, you know, as I said in my story, I said anytime Texas offers a quarterback, that's, that's newsworthy, right? Because – Sark and, and A.J. Milby, they don't just kind of – they're pretty precise with who they go after in terms of quarterback recruiting. They don't go out, out and offer 20 quarterbacks. It's usually one, two, maybe three guys that they target. Well, they offered two 2026 20, quarterbacks uh, last week, and Troy Hewn is, is the one I talked to out of California. Uh, loves Texas a lot. Like I said, he's been to Texas, I think, three times already. Plans to return a couple more times before the end of summer. So – you know, quarterback recruiting is always interesting to watch. KJ Lacey, you know, where will he wind up visiting over the once this dead period lifts? So, quarterback, you know, it can kind of have a trickle down effect, uh, one class to the next. So, we'll, we'll keep an eye on Troy Hune, KJ Lacey, once this dead period lifts uh, in what about two weeks? So. Guys, I was going to, and I want to get some more thoughts on, on Davison because somebody had an interesting chat. But, Jason, you just made me think of something in terms of this being the dead period right now. And it rolls till what March 4th is when everything opens back up. I think that's and, right. Monday. Yeah. And we've defined that as when you say dead period, that's a physical thing. That's a face to face, no face to face, no, no going to the living room on one side and no coming mm -hmm. to the campus on the other side. But both of you guys talk to me about what, the, what right now, what's going on. Cause we know it's not nothing. So if I'm in that coaching staff, if I'm Kenny Baker, if I'm Sark, I'm whoever it is, what do you guys think the focus is right now? Like, there's no way it just stops in recruiting, right? I mean, are they practicing how and when to send an Instagram post? Like, what's going on right now 
in recruiting world, even though it's the dead period. Yeah, it's probably different for Kenny Baker, right? Because he's he's probably still just mass texting people, maybe doing FaceTime calls, you know, trying to get to know guys. Um, you know, Sark to me, I'm always fascinated how how involved he is with so many guys. Like I'm like, how does this dude find the time to text or DM so many dudes? You know, I don't know that he's sitting there having 45 minute phone calls with, with a lot of guys, but he does communicate usually via text or like I said, uh, a private message or a direct message, um, but usually via text, I think with a ton of guys. So right now it's just kind of keeping tabs on guys. Hey dude, hope you're having a good week. And it's not even a lot of football talk. Sometimes when I talk to these recruits, they're like, yeah, we don't really even talk that much football. Like there will be a time for that. But right now it's more just kind of getting to know guys. Like you said, dead period. You cannot have face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, technically, yeah, a recruit could visit the UT campus, but he can't have any face-to-face -face interaction with the coaches. Um, coaches obviously can't go to schools, can't do anything like that. So it's all done usually via the phone at this point until March. But right now it's just kind of, for lack of better description, keeping guys warm a little bit, you know, letting them know that, hey, that they're a priority, just make them, uh, make them feel loved a little bit, and then things will pick up in March, like you said, when the dead period lifts. Then they start bringing them into spring practices and spring games, and then we get into – Summer official visits, so on and so forth. But right now, it's just kind of keep in touch through through the phone mostly. Well, Chad, Chad real quick, because I have a, a slightly different answer to that question. Okay. Um, I think everything Jason said is 100% correct. A couple of things I would add. Number one, as the dead period hits, we got to keep in mind that the roles inside the infrastructure of the program have changed a little bit, right? So – the, the former director of player personnel is gone in that space as a new person. We've seen, you know, Brandon Harris has been elevated to the spot of GM. We've seen that Taylor Searles has gone to director of recruiting. So everybody's roles in this dead period have slightly changed. I, I bet Brandon Harris isn't doing a lot of things different in the GM role that he was probably already doing, but, some of what he was doing previously now is Taylor Serrells' job. Um, so we've seen some move around. So I think all of that happens at a time. So I think behind the scenes, everybody's probably slightly adjusting to this, to their new roles and the capacities that come with that. So I think the dead period probably hits at a time where Texas behind the scenes can kind of get their ducks in a row. And okay, now you're the GM and this means this. And you used to be, an assistant to the recruiting department. But now, Taylor Searles, you're the actual recruiting director. It does mean a different set of responsibilities, a different job. I think there's probably a couple of things that they're doing in addition to just constant phone calls, DMing, texting, those types of things. I think, number one, they're working on getting a lot of these guys on campus. I, I wrote about them at 10 Thoughts in the Weekend, but – you know, they had one recruiting event in January and they did, I mean, it was a pretty bang up day. There were a lot of big time guys that showed up, but there were a lot of guys inside the top 10 in the state. There will be guys from out of state that they're recruiting that they want to get on campus that wasn't a part of that mix. So I think, you know, just as an example, if we're looking at Michael Fasusi, the last time I have have him on the Austin campus was October 7th. So we're now four months into four plus months into it'll be five months. By the time the dead period hits, you want to get that guy back on campus. You don't want five, six months of a calendar year going by where your biggest offensive line target doesn't. Now he's been on campus four times. So it's not like they haven't had Michael Fasusi on campus I had him four times last year, October Which, 7th. I was about to say, it's funny to have him four times because the first visit didn't happen until last spring. I remember talking to him at a, I think it was an Under Armour yep. camp or Rivals camp, and he's like, yeah, I've never even visited Texas, but I, I think he had just got the offer. He's like, I'm going to go visit for the first time, and since then it's been boom, boom, boom. But you're right, they need to get him back on campus uh, in March or April. May 12th, June 2nd, September 16th, October 7th. So that's great to be able to, that's exactly what you want. Now you want to get him on campus again to reinforce what he would have liked about all of those other visits. 
Um, you know, a guy like Jonah Williams, five stars, probably leaning to Oklahoma right now, five star safety, Galveston Ball. He visited January 21st of last year, March 25th of last year. He was at the pool party. So July 27th of last year. But it's been since July 27th since they've had that five star on campus. So when you're asking what are the Longhorns doing right now, I think they're getting their ducks in a row with their biggest targets. And that dovetails nicely into what I think they're probably doing right now. And it's funny because Jason's working on the recruiting board. One of the things that you got to do on a recruiting board when they've offered 150 kids, hmm. right, close Jason? That- yeah. A little under, but close to it, yeah. So you've got to decide who are our priorities. <laughs> what if they all say yes? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> how many wide receivers have they offered, Jason, off the top of your head? Oh, gosh, I don't even know. I'm not even – 15, to 16, like, you know, yeah, I'd have, I'm sure – But a lot of these offers are like – I don't even consider them real offers. I mean, they offer it a running back in wherever, New Jersey or something. They're really not recruiting that heavily. But, but technically he has an offer, so he's on our – Recruiting board somewhere, right? I think they're. I think Chad with a new linebackers coach, a new defensive tack, a new defensive line coach, uh, and all of these new people adjusting their roles behind the scenes. I think a lot of what they're probably talking about is who are the main guys, who is it that are our number one priorities. There are tiers to this, right? And. Michael Fasusi on an offensive line tier is going to be separate than other guys that they've offered. What Texas does a great job of, and Jason can speak to this, when Mac was here, they would make offers and they really struggled with spitting game towards these guys, right? They they didn't Mac didn't know how to necessarily offer a guy, but then not treat him like he would accept his commit right away. And Texas really operates from the, we don't want anybody's commitment right now. So if we offer you, don't even think about committing. You take your visits. And it really, if you, if you, if you, if you take the accepting commitments off the table, it really allows you to let the process kind of evolve. So the one thing you don't have is a guy like Quandre Diggs sitting around going, how come I haven't gotten a scholarship offer yet? And it's like, well, we can't offer you because we don't know what we're going to do with you. And it's like, no, offer that kid a scholarship, let him feel good. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out this other stuff later. They've offered everybody in the state for the most part who they really want to offer. There'll be some guys that get offers in the spring, but if we were to go through the top 10, top 25, top 50, most of those guys have offers. So now it's about really, getting together with your new player personnel guy, meeting with your new director of recruiting, talking about the visits with those prospects and, you know, and making sure that your coaches and your support team are on the exact same page with regards to who's our number one ranked wide receiver, who's number two, who's number eight that we really like, but we wouldn't take unless we swing and miss on one, two, and three. Like there are these nuanced conversations and I think during the dead period, there's a lot of that going on. Well, they did. I counted 23 receiver off wide receiver. Are <laughs> you telling me they wouldn't take all 23 of those dudes? What are you talking about? Man, man that's a depth chart right there. 23? <laughs> that's a recruiting <laughs> class, Chad. That's a serious depth chart right there. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's just shy. Just two more. Two more and you got a whole class there. <laughs> um, recruiting wouldn't react to that, right? If one team signed 23 receivers? <laughs> That wouldn't be a big deal. Um, real quick, just to circle back around to Davis and fellas, our guy Cody Carpentier has a comp, and I wanted to get y'all's response to it. It's bold. It's bold. It's Bijan 2.0. Catch, you mentioned the Ezekiel Elliott thing. Not only that he idolizes Elliott on some level, I've heard him described a little bit of as, a, as an Ezekiel Elliott type of runner in some ways at, what, 5'11", 203 is what I'm seeing here. Let me get y'all's reaction to that. Jason, is that fair? Bijan 2.0. I don't think that's fair to anybody, right? To be <laughs> compared to Bijan. Um, I like Jordan Davison, but I don't think he's in Bijan's class. Uh, he's 
you know, you're right. He's listed at 5'11", 203. I, I don't know if he's quite 5'11". He's, he's a pretty compact dude. I mean, you know, Bijan, I think, is a little more stretched out. Uh, Bijan's probably a more powerful, better receiver, uh, a little maybe more elusive, I think, even with Bijan. Um, Jordan Davison's a fantastic prospect. I mean, he's a five-star prospect for a reason. I don't think he's quite in Bijan's class and just a different style of player. Maybe not quite as well-rounded as Bijan, but honestly, I don't really know many backs that are as well-rounded as Bijan. Yeah. Catch, what do you think? In retrospect, Bijan should have been a six-star. <laughs> and, and then I think it makes the conversation of a guy like Bijan, I mean, uh, Davison much easier because I – I felt like Bijan was a five-star running back, but again, maybe kind of a no doubt about it guy. Whereas if I think last year in the recruiting class, even going back to two years ago when we had the CJ Baxter conversations, I was never a guy that believed CJ Baxter was truly a five-star because Bijan Robinson was a five-star and I never thought CJ Baxter was Bijan Robinson. So Bijan, here's what I want from you, Cody. Do you think he's Bijan 2.0? Yeah, he clarified his comment. Let me jump in. He said Texas is Bijan. Our situation is Bijan 2.0. Oh, Ohio okay. State okay. Now this makes yeah. a million percent. Cody, I was about to challenge you. Yeah, and they're both kind. Of, I mean, not West Coast, but Arizona and California. So they're both guys ah. from west out west. So um, yeah, no, that's now that's a good uh, rep or comparison, Cody. Yeah. But I was uh, say Cody, comp. Okay, got it. Cody knows what his like Thursday or Friday content piece needs to be <laughs> if, if it's Bijan 2.0. But Cody, you can you can now step I can we can step away from the ledge on that. Uh, I think Cody's exactly right. When you compare the recruitments, they are kind of eerily similar. I think Davison's a borderline five star for me. I I won't argue five star. I think he's better than the running backs that were in five-star conversation a year ago. And I would rank him higher than C.J. Baxter from two years ago. Um, but wow. I I don't hey, know. <clears throat> Rivals has him ranked higher than anybody. Like, I'm looking – if this is accurate, 24-7 has him number 148 nationally. Wow. Yeah, on three no, numbers. I think he's better than that. Yeah. Uh, so pretty big variation. Where the rest of the services have him at? Uh, if these are updated, on three, 66 nationally, 24-7, 148 nationally, ESPN 34 nationally. Uh, Rivals, it shows 13. Where does that's Rivals? A, that's accurate. They haven't updated their – I don't think they've updated the rankings since December. And I think yeah, that's 13. Most, so, yeah. yeah. I, so, got Say, Chad, you won't hear me say this very often. I think ESPN's grade is probably <laughs> my favorite grade of him so far. They've got him at 34, which is like borderline five-star. That means nationally elite, but not on a Bijan tier. Okay. I think that's probably where if I was ranking him, and I got to be honest, I haven't looked like hardcore at Jordan's video and – couple of months probably since november or december where i just sat down and did a deep dive on him uh not to steal anything from alex uh in the deep dig um yeah i i like the i think the other two places have him i think on three and 24 7 have him rated a little too low rivals might have him a little too high uh, although I think that's probably an Adam Gorney ranking. Look, Adam's the head of Rivals Recruiting. He's on the West Coast. He's seen Jordan, I think, in person last year. I think he saw him play in person several times. So he would have as strong of a grasp of Davison's kind of skill set right now as anybody. And look, I will say this about Adam. He is not a whore when it comes to five-star rankings. They don't like to give them out early. They don't like to give them out in mass early. Uh, we saw them not even give out 32 this year because they weren't quite sure that the talent in the 2024 class warranted 32 five stars, which that's another conversation for another day. Um, but if they've got that kid ranked that high, which they do, it's not because they haven't done 
a full evaluation on him. And, you know, to be fair, he's got 44 offers, all the schools that he's visiting. You know, he's been to Alabama. He's been to Ohio State. It's Texas. This isn't one of those recruitments where you look at the schools that are recruiting him and you go, he's 13th in the country and he's looking at, you know, Tennessee. I don't know. I don't even know. Arizona State. Yeah. Of, but, you know, yeah, it's, and it's sometimes, it's, sometimes it's tough on running backs because, I mean, listen, he's playing behind an, an offensive line where probably all five guys will probably go Division One, right? I, I don't Very know. Very Cedric Benson ish in terms yeah, of. Yeah. I mean, it worked for Benson, but we've seen other five star running backs who are like, okay, wait, was he just a product of just a badass high school football team that made him look better than he was? So, um, Kevin yeah, Durham is an example of that, right? Where I you know, that guy's got 10, 400 meter <laughs> yeah. speed, but at Duncanville, Chad, you know, you saw them play in person last year. Yeah. He's playing behind an offensive line where most of those guys are going to play college football. And he was playing behind an offensive line where it's like, you know, he's scary when he gets to the second level, but it's like, when he gets to the second level on every carry, because second level is the first level for Duncan. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It does make it a bit tricky to completely. Ev- that guy ran behind an offensive line, who the left tackle went to Auburn and the right tackle went to Texas, and the guys between them weren't slouches either. So yes, uh, it is. I think I think Jason makes a good point. It's not all apples to apples when you talk about grading running back recruits and what they're working behind. And, you know, when we think about, um, oh, God, why am I having a brain malfunction? The kid at AM right now that was a five-star. Uh, oh, Ruben, Ruben Owens. Owen. Thank you. For some reason, Jason, I've been wanting to call Ruben Owens Lake Sea Strunk for the last <laughs> three years. I have no idea why, but every yeah. time I want to have a Ruben Owens conversation, I almost call him Lake Sea Strunk. Uh, I don't know if there's a Freudian slip in there or not, but – you know, the thing that I would have said about Ruben Owens is like, how do you grade what he's doing? Because he's playing against competition that is so inferior. Hey, he played against the Bay City Black Cats. Uh, <laughs> once upon a time, that would have meant something. <laughs> That's where I'm from, Chad. Uh-huh. I got you. <laughs> once upon a time, that would have meant a lot. Um, has it? What, golly, that was 20 years ago when they had. Um, who was their head coach? That Chad Morris. Chad Morris was there, yeah. When Chad yeah. Morris was at Bay City and back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the the issues that one would have with evaluating Davison are completely different than the issues that you would look at with Owens. And yet, you're trying to compare those two kids and match them up together. Um, and one thing's not like the other, even remotely. All right, catch. What else we got to, to clean up here before we get uh, get out? I've got one thing, and I wanted to throw this at Jason. I don't know if you saw this while you were uh, taking a peek at my column last night and giving it a once over and trying to clean it up on any ty- uh, typos that might have existed. Did you notice the kid amongst the the? So Chad, what I did was I took the top twenty uncommitted prospects in the state of Texas from the current rivals rankings. And then I just counted how many times, and it's kind of an unofficial list because sometimes guys will sneak in for a game, but they won't promote it. It won't, they won't, you know, I, I I went back through every single kid and we, some of the stuff is pretty well chronicled. Jason does a really good job actually when kids visit Texas of making sure that that visit gets in the database. But for every kid I went back, and made sure that we weren't leaving anything off, if there was anything to leave off. One kid, Jason, had eight visits to Texas so far. Did you see that? Andrew Marsh. Oh, is it Marsh? I was thinking Marsh or Ja'Cory Watson. Um, yeah, number, Marsh has been a, a ton, yeah. He visits number, everywhere a bunch, but yeah. The number 29 prospect in the country, Chad. He's a high four-star right now, but – with his current ranking, if that were to hold, we would think that probably puts him in a five-star tier. Listen to this. October 28th of last year, September 16th of last year, June 4th of last year, March 25th of last year, January 21st. He made five, at least five visits last year. 
Man. Then there was September 10th of 2022. He was at the Alabama game, 6 11 22. So he came to a Texas camp. And then 1 22 22, he would have come in for a junior day, which would have been a sophomore day for him. Eight visits. My typically, my general rule of thumb is you want to get guys on campus six times. If you can get them on campus six times, you're in the sweet spot of about what it takes to land a guy. Marsh, by far and away, just to give you guys like apples to apples, let me just go through. Jonah Williams, three times. Michael Fasusi, four times. Uh, Dorian Brew, one time. DJ Sanders, one time. Khalid Lockett, four times. Michael Riles, one time. Keody Armstrong, one time. Lamont Rogers, three times. Uh, DeAndre Ryden, three times. Chad Wolford, Woodford, three times. Michael Terry, two times. Andrew Marsh has been on campus eight times. That's and crazy. yet, Texas isn't regarded as a runaway leader there. In fact, mm -hmm. as his recruitment is kind of evolving, I don't know if Texas is. I don't, I don't know that I completely understand where Texas is with Marsh. I know his sister was a student at AM, if I'm not mistaken. I know AM is oh, in it. Like no, AM's in a good spot there. Um, yeah. Well, Jason, you just, you just referenced it. You didn't blink when Ketch said eight times, and you're acting like the kid is able to carve out this kind of time for multiple schools. Yeah, he visits a lot. There aren't many weekends when Andrew stays home, but with this <laughs> team, uh, you know, he did not come in for the junior day in, he did not. in January. So um, I think yeah. he did go to AM like the following week. He and his, his mom, I've met him and I've, Andrew a couple times, and his mom, awesome, awesome people. So they're just very, uh, very invested in the recruiting process in a good way. I mean, they're doing a lot of research. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, he's visited. I would, I would reckon he's probably visited AM probably eight times or more as well. So he, I've he, got AM with four, but I bet that's underselling the yeah, numbers. I would almost he's, guarantee it. Yeah. I've got Oklahoma with five visits. So, you know, LA and I know one of the tech early. visits was he was in Austin uh, last summer, summer, I believe it was, for a seven on seven tournament. And while he was there, like he was done playing, so he swooped down to campus for like 15 minutes. So I mean, you know, things, but still a visit. I mean, he still went and met with the coaches for for a few minutes. So I don't know if we even counted that one, Jason. I think probably it would have been one of the summer visits. But I don't. I mean, okay. You know. Well, regardless, if you, I, I just think it's I, I only brought it up, Chad, because the guy that has made the most amount of visits that I've been able to count, um, and look. I'll keep doing my homework and maybe maybe there's somebody else that is in that area that I just haven't chronicled real well. But it's just interesting to me that the guy on the list with the most visits, um, you know, I don't I I'm a little confused as to where Texas truly stands in that recruitment. He's gonna take more visits, but like Jason said, he got his butt down to AM in January and if we're going to say that one of the reasons why we thought Texas is a leader for Davison over Ohio State is because he had to make a decision and he visited Texas in January instead of Ohio State, the same line of reasoning could work with a guy like Andrew Marsh, given this, you know, with Texas only, he could have gone to AM on three or four different weekends. AM had kids in last weekend of February. And I think every weekend in January, they had recruiting events where guys were coming on campus. Texas had won. And when given the choice of going to Texas or Texas A&M, when he could have visited on the 27th or that first weekend in February, he did visit A&M. It does leave a little bit of an impression of, okay, well, maybe the Aggies have a little bit of an edge right now over the Longhorns. Doesn't mean everything. These things can take on a life. The kid could visit Texas mid-March. He probably will at some point. And maybe it looks and feels a little different. But I just brought that one up because when I did, you know who might have almost eight visits under his belt is <laughs> Jordan Davison. <laughs> and he's probably about about five, I'm guessing. The one if I'm picking one who's been and I, we only have seven in the database, but I know we're missing some. Landon Rink, that dude. Yeah. Been, he comes in, you know, his dad played at Texas, of course, but he comes in for just about every uh, recruiting event. And yeah, But then you've got guys, some guys, uh, 
you know, maybe when they commit and they show up at every single game, then I'm like, okay, I just quit entering those at some point. You know, it's like once they become commits. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, man, I can't put in 50 visits for you. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, once you're committed and hitting every single weekend, it's a different, that's yeah. a different discussion. All Put right, Chad, I'm good. I got, I, well, if you had to pick today, you think Andrew Marsh, if you had to put in a future cast today, would you it Andrew wouldn't be Texas. I, it would not be Texas. I, and I'm, like I guess I'll work on my recruiting board. So that'll be out probably, hopefully, knock on wood, maybe Thursday, but um, next Thursday. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> my goal is this Thursday so I can write about it in the war room. But um, uh, yeah, I would probably put him at about like 40, 45% versus the field. Yeah. Okay. Guys, Meeting speaking off. of the Longhorns and the Aggies, one thing I wanted each of you to deal with before we get out of here, before we do that, uh, as we wrap up the recruiting hour, let's let Lisa tell you about all the good stuff at Specs. Lisa? No matter what you're needing, Specs Same Day Delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world-class wines to hard-to-find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's Specs. Cheers to savings. Yes, indeed. Also, a reminder, if it's finally time for you to jump on into Orange Bloods, there's your QR code uh, to go find out what is going on. Ten thoughts from the weekend every Sunday from the guy in your upper left, the 321 article, uh, and so much recruiting stuff. You're not going to be able to stand it from the guy in the upper right rocking that blue. Uh, Orangebloods.com, Anwar stuff. Alex's stuff and the craziest message board on God's green. Earth. Don't forget Cody Carpentier. That's right. Cody Carpentier is now a part of it, and he's going to be breaking down all kinds of stuff for you. Uh, baseball season cranked up, basketball season, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of coverage. Uh, there is your QR code for orangebloods.com. All right, gentlemen, just real quick on our way out, because I know some Longhorn fans have been asking, do we have any evidence – that the Longhorns fell into any kind of a Jimbo trap when it comes to Sark. Because apparently there's been a lot of discussion between Longhorn folk and Aggie folk about what happened over the weekend. Any indication from you guys that the G word was used in this contract, guaranteed? I have not heard of a buyout on this contract yet. That's not to say that one doesn't exist, but in going through what was put online from what the board of regents discussion is going to be. There were a lot of details related to that contract. A buyout number is not one that I've seen. Look, Jimmy Sexton doesn't do deals where his clients don't typically get their money. So yeah. I don't know if that means that we're talking about 70 ish guaranteed. I think we'll keep digging around on that. Uh, but it wouldn't shock me if that's the case. You know, the difference in this situation, I mean, look, I guess I would say this, is Dabo's contract guaranteed? Is there a buyout at Clemson? Is is Kirby Smart's contract guaranteed at Georgia? Um, I don't know how worried they would be about a, a, a buyout number, given that they're hiring someone who is successful. You know, the, the elephant in the room with regards to Jimbo Jimbo's contract and Sark's contract was that Jimbo never quite hit the justification point where you would say, ah, oh, hell yeah, Gar that guaranteed number was 100 plus and it was day one. And it was always the number that Jimbo was trying to justify, it felt like. Like get to a level where suddenly the rest of the contract doesn't feel like an albatross. Um, Sark having just gone to the playoff with three years on his deal remaining. I mean, should Texas be concerned? No. Should there be a thought in the back of your mind? Like seven years is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Seven years is a long time. I, I, I told you, Chad, if it was me, that probably would have been a, a three. Three years left, add three more years, six feels fine. But when you got Jimmy Sexton as your agent, he's not going to leave. <laughs> if he wants seven, he's going to get seven. Yeah, just in listening to it, Jason, though, I have not heard those key words, fully guaranteed. The Aggies started Jimbo at fully guaranteed, then they re-upped at fully guaranteed. I have not heard those two words around Sark yet. I haven't either, and like, but I have also haven't heard the word buyout either, like Ketch said. So I, yeah. you know, I don't know what the exact terms are. 
But also, like Ket said, uh, Sark's kind of kind of earned the benefit of the doubt after last year and just the trajectory of this program and the way they've been recruiting. Jimbo, like Ketch said, they gave him the big contract right off the bat, and he was always trying to justify it, you know, play coach well enough to justify that that contract. I think I think it's a little bit safer bet with Sark with the tra- trajectory that he's already on. All I know is I am shocked that Longhorn fans and Aggie fans are talking to each other on social media. That is a shocker, shocker uh, on a Monday as we get a little closer to both in the SEC. 133 days from now, Texas will officially be a member of the SEC. All right, Catch, you ready? Yes, sir. I was going right. to say real quick. Yeah. I, I, me, between myself, Onwar, and Jason, I'll make it a mission in like the next 24 hours – to try to get an answer on the guarantee. And then if we get it, we know one of our topics for tomorrow's shows. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. That would be it. And for the record, Catch, I have assumed that the answer to your two questions about those other two coaches is no, that it's not a fully guaranteed contract till the last day, that there's something in place that, you know, if Dabo is done tomorrow, if Kirby decides in four weeks he's out, he doesn't get the rest of his contract paid out in full. That's my assumption. Well, you know what happens when you make assumptions. I know. I do. Believe I, me, I've made I, so many. That'll happen. That will happen. All right. Uh, that is your recruiting hour. Remember, we do this Mondays and Wednesdays uh, here on Orange Bloods Live. Uh, thanks to Jason Sukamel for jumping in to get us the latest information. Keep an eye on that name, Jordan Davison. By the way, as you see it on the title today, interesting spelling. Two O's in the word Jordan, which I don't think I've ever seen. And then a Davison, not Davidson, but a Davison. So kind of unique on both names. Longhorn fans hoping you're hoping you have to memorize that spelling coming up uh, for the class of 25. So there's your recruiting hour. Remember, this time slot tomorrow, it will be the Modcast on a Tuesday. You got all the shows coming up. So get your likes, subscribe, get those notifications so you know uh, what shows are coming up. You know what's uh, what's there. Thanks to everybody for jumping in the chat today. We appreciate you. Until next time, it is the recruiting hour. And this is Orange Bloods Live.